So today it is my great honor to introduce Professor uh, Lewin here. Uh, he is a professor in Georgia Tech and when you think about uh, unsteady combustion processes in acoustics flame interaction in this field, you will always think of him because he has been doing great work in Georgia Tech. I have been uh, following his research for quite a few, few years now and uh, it's great to have you again. Um, uh, apart from you know his uh, research uh, you know achievements, uh, he is a great teacher, and I can vouch for that personally because I took this course uh, four years back, and when I sat through uh, this course uh, for you know it was a three days course again I think, and I learned a lot of things because uh, you know not always you go come across these unsteady processes in the normal uh, combustion classes, and having this class was a very good beneficial thing for me. And later on, I learned uh, from his notes, and every now and then I'll go back, check his lectures on the video uh, we have on YouTube, and also the, the notes he gave us. And it was very helpful, and I, I, I hope that you will, you will find it uh, as helpful as well. And lastly, uh, last but not the least, uh, we should all thank him, because uh, you know you, you have an ad actual book uh, uh, with your, with your uh, lecture notes for if you are enrolled for this class. And that's all because he, uh, you know, he gave you these books from uh, by his own account. So please thank him and uh, welcome him once again. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. And it's a privilege to be here. I guess the last time I was, I taught this course at the summer school was two years ago? Well, four years ago. Four years ago. Well, Two years ago, I was in Beijing. OK, that's right. All right, so it's always a lot of fun for me to uh, interact with everyone here. And um, I think it might be, I think it'll be helpful for me to know who I'm talking to and what you're all interested in. So maybe if it's OK, we'll just do a quick round the room, lap around the room. And if you can just quickly uh, just introduce yourself and maybe tell me a little bit about what you're working on and what your interests are. And in particular, if you're working in a topic that directly intersects with this course, you know, what I did was I took I have taught this as a whole, what, what, what I'm going to give to you, I've taught as an entire week and I've taught it as, as two whole weeks. So there's a whole lot of different directions I can go um, and I can go fast through things or I can slow down in things. So maybe if I, if there's a particular area of interest for uh, several of you, I can do that and, and it might be helpful to know um, where you're coming from and what you're interested in. So maybe we'll just start on the bottom right. N nano processing? Transient processing. Transient. Okay. Great. Thank you. Oh, bummer. That'll work. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to put my feet up while I'm talking to you all. <laughs> okay. Right here. You said you're from NASA? Yeah, NASA DLC. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. Okay. With, with what kind of fuel? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, you're developing catalysts. OK, yep. Got it. Thank you. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear it. You're working on propulsion for, for liquid rockets? Yes. OK, all right. Thank you. <coughs> That's good. All right, well, thank you all. That was helpful. Um, so I, uh, I think every year I've taught this class, I've changed the title a little bit. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the basic approach that I've taken in this class is, um, is try to, is I would say it's use inspired as opposed to dis sort of discovery oriented fundamentals. So in other words, a lot of the work that I do is on flowing combustion systems, whether those are rockets or gas turbines or furnaces. Um, I'm just, I'm basically in, uh, in contrast to, say, uh, diesel engines or re other reciprocating engines, which are also very unsteady, but they have their own, you know, they're not flowing systems, they're more constant volume systems. And so these types of combustion systems, there's a variety of really, really interesting practical challenges that you run into when you develop these systems to um, make them lighter or to reduce the environmental impact or to increase the overall performance of these systems. And, and we're going we're gonna to spend the next hour talking about those. But those problems, let's just say thermoacoustic instability, which several of you in this room uh, mentioned 
is, is the area you're working on. Very important problem. You can't sell a jet engine if you have a, a violent thermoacoustic instability. So really important practical problem. But it turns out that that problem flows down in some really interesting fundamentals. And so the way this course is, is sort of organized is to think about kind of what are some of the big picture challenges with developing combustion systems. So that's what I mean by use inspired. And then flowing that backwards into what are sort of the fundamentals, what are the, the, the key issues that you have to understand to really, when you, whether you're talking about thermoacoustic instabilities or whether you're talking about lean blowout or rich blowout or flashback or any of the other host of challenges you, you face in developing um, flowing combustion systems. So that's kind of the, uh, the approach taken in this class. Um, and uh, so just a couple references for you that these are, these are kind of my standard references for, uh, for topics of this nature. So uh, Professor Law, the organizer of this class, this is a great book, um, Combustion Physics. And, um, and then, uh, so the book that, that I think you all, did you all get a copy of, of this book? So Unsteady Combustor Physics, the idea was, you'll notice that I, I actually, this is called Combustion Physics. This book is called Combustor Physics. And the title, that was very intentional. The idea was, what are the physics associated with a system, a combustor system? You know, combustion is one process inside of a combustor. You know, there's a lot of fluid mechanics that goes on inside of a combustor. There's a lot of acoustics that goes on inside of a combustor, which interact with combustion. And so you can sort of think of, of this book as trying to take combustion physics and then flow and then saying what, what new physics happens when you actually put that inside of a system, uh, where you have new system dynamics that doesn't appear when it's in isolation. Um, so this is a nice book, too, as well. A number of you, I think probably a third of you, I, th I think, are working on gas turbine problems. <coughs> so this is a, pr a pretty applied book. Um, and so it's not going to give you the uh, sort of the detailed fundamental understanding of phenomena. But what it does do is it gives you a good feel for, again, what does a combustor, a modern combustor architecture look like, which then flows down to important canonical problems. So a simple example would be a really important canonical problem in combustion is, sw is, is a swirling jet. All right. And I think a couple of you talked about swirl flows. A swirling jet, it's, it's very fundamentally interesting, but it's also sort of a very standard approach for stabilizing flames in, in gas turbine or, or actually any type of flowing combustion system. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. But this book, is, it's, it's nice just to kind of ground you in the uh, more the more practical side. Um, then uh, there's this, this book I wrote here. This is an edited volume called Gas Turbine Emissions. Um, and this focuses on, um, again, kind of system level issues and then flowing that down into the emissions from gas turbines. But it starts, it doesn't, it has sort of deep dive chapters on the fundamentals of, of, of the kinetics of, of how emissions are formed. But it also moves that all the way up into, if, for example, if you're thinking about aircraft engines, think about the overall US or, or global um, air traffic control system and then flowing that down into an aircraft and then flowing that down into an engine and then flowing that down into the combustor and then flowing that down into kinetics. So the idea is to help you see how these kinetic challenges flow out of the sort of the macro challenges. And that was, that's the approach taken here. And then, and then finally, this book right here is also another book I edited called Combustion Instabilities in Gas Turbine Engines. Similar approach. And, and this is completely focused on thermoacoustic instabilities which we'll get into a little bit later, but it's one of the most significant challenges in flowing in low NOx combustion systems. Um, and so it has case studies from people who actually design gas turbines, but it also has very, very fundamental chapters on how flames and acoustic waves interact and hydrodynamic instabilities and things like that. So this is our, uh, our course outline. So I've, um, there's a lot to go over. And like I said, I've actually delivered this same course in two weeks, and we're going to do it here in three days three half days. So um, there's a lot I can and cannot cover. But this is basically the idea. We're going to spend, the, we've already spent a good chunk of the first hour um, with, with an intro and an outlook. And the idea here is just to kind of set the stage for you for, again, thinking about from the application point of view, how does that flow down into real world fundamental problems in the combustion side, which we will then spend the, the other eight hours of this class talking about. And then the rest of this class, we're going to be talking about some of these really, really interesting, fascinating fundamental combustion problems that flow out of the challenges associated with making a modern combustor system. So for example, um, this uh, out, uh, topic B, flame aerodynamics and flashback. Flame aerodynamics, um, how many of you are familiar with that phrase? 
Okay, so you've probably heard the word aerodynamics, um, but flame aerodynamics, you'll see it in some older literature, but it's a really interesting topic, and it's really a fluid mechanics, it's really a fluid mechanics question, and, and basically the question is, in a flow with really strong density gradients, how does that affect the fluid mechanics? So there's really, the question is not, you're not even thinking about kinetics uh, there, but just the whole idea is, you know, just like if, if you have sh um, high speed flows and you have shock waves. Obviously, when you have shock waves, those can cause strong refraction of the flow, they can bend the flow. Um, but what's interesting about the combustion application, um, at least the subsonic combustion application, is the flow can feel the flame well upstream of the flame. So the flow starts doing funky things because it knows there's a strong density gradient ahead of it. And that can lead to some really interesting things. It can lead to instabilities. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Darius Landau instability? Um, so the Darius Landau instability is a classic instability which says that if you take a premixed flame, it, you can't have a flat premixed flame with a constant burning velocity. So if you take a premixed flame that propagates with a constant flame speed, it's impossible for that flame to just stay flat. It will spontaneously develop wrinkles of its own. And the reason for that is has nothing to do with kinetics. It has exclusively to do with flame aerodynamics, is the fact that if you develop a wrinkle on a flame, that changes the approach flow. In fact, it decelerates the approach flow so the flame can propagate faster, which decelerates the flow more, and so forth. So that's a simple example of flame aerodynamics. We're going to talk about flame aerodynamics because if you want to understand a, a thing like flashback. So how many of you have, have learned about flashback? So flashback is this classic topic. Um, you know, Lewis and Von Elby's book, Professor Law's book, Steve Turn's book, they all talk about flashback. But really, most of those treatments implicitly are isothermal treatments. So they don't, they don't really talk about the fact that because there's a strong gas expansion across the flame, you can't just impose a flame position, that the flame and the flow sort of mutually decide where the flame's going to sit and then what the corresponding flow will going to be. It's strongly coupled because of the gas expansion. Um, and what that does is it adds some new, some new physics to the problem. So one of the things I'll show you, for example, is, is that flames can cause boundary layer separation. So in fact, the, the, the density gradient across a flame causes a, an adverse pressure gradient. So you, you, you may all know from shear flow that when you have an adverse pressure gradient in a boundary layer, it causes, it causes a boundary layer separation. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but flames can give you that adverse pressure gradient. And so a flame can actually separate a boundary layer in front of it. And as soon as the boundary layer separates, you get a low speed flow so the flame can propagate farther upstream. So that's another example sort of, of why flame aerodynamics matters. Another, I'll give you one more example and then I'll move on. Swirl flows. Uh, really, really interesting fluid mechanics and swirl flows. Super complicated. You know, I always, I, I talk to uh, people who design these things and I, and I always tell them, you know, if, if you guys wanted to design the most complicated flow field that nobody understands, you, you succeeded. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, because swirling, even isothermal swirl flow dynamics is very, very much an open, an open topic. Um, and, and even today, we really lack what I would call a taxonomy for categorizing and understanding the dynamics of flows where, and by the way, swirl means when the flow has a strong azimuthal component. Once you start to have an azimuthal velocity that's on the order of the axial velocity, which is what you have in, swirl, in gas turbine combustors, you get some really, really f interesting fluid mechanics. And we'll talk about that later. But, those, but then you start adding a flame to that. The flame gives you this monster gas expansion, acceleration right through it. That totally changes the flow field. I mean, it turns a dog into a cat, so to speak. You know, you, you, you have a flow field, which is kind of one thing. When you add a pop a flame into it, the strong gas expansion, can fundamentally change the, the nature of the flow field. And you can get some really interesting new things. And, and the whole idea is, is if you just think about the fluid mechanics, or if you just think about the flame, you'll miss it. You gotta have the two together, that coupling. So that's what flame aerodynamics means. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, you won't, like I said, you'll, you'll, you won't see this word in a lot of modern textbooks, but it's, I, just, I just wanna kind of sort of open your eyes to how interesting and important it is. But again, it's really fluid mechanics but fluid mechanics and flows with strong density gradients. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's that. Um, then we'll talk about, <coughs> we're, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about internal flame structure. So we're gonna talk a lot about flame stretch and the response of flames to inhomogeneities in, in the flow. So for example, if you have a turbulent flow, how does that change the flame structure? How does that change the, the, the burning rate of the flame? What happens if a flame has an edge? Um, 
So a lot of the, the, um, the, the canonical analyses you, you, you will see in most books assumes that the flame is continuous, which is fine except for where the flame is stabilized, right? So if you take a Bunsen flame, the Bunsen flame is a beginning, right, at the edge. And at that beginning point, the gradients along the flame are just as sharp as the gradients normal to the flame. So all those flamelet hypotheses that kind of go into classic flamelet assumption analyses just goes out the window. Because really, a, a key implicit assumption of flamelet analyses is, is that the strongest gradients are normal to the flame, not transverse to the flame. Edge flames, it's a whole different animal. Um, and you can, get some, you can get some new phenomenon. And uh, so why are we going to talk about these? Because we want to talk about, uh, so sort of the motivating idea is flame stabilization. Why is it that flames stabilize? What causes them to blow off? What causes them to stabilize? And a key piece of that is whenever you have a flame being stabilized, it's in a low velocity region because the flow velocities are much higher than the flame speed. But it's also in a region of very high shear, very high shear. And high shear um, will almost always lead to high flame stretch. And it will also lead to, because, because the flame starts at the stabilization point, it means you have an edge flame there. So I want to talk about that. Um, so then what we're going to talk about in D and E is a different topic. So this is flashback and flame stabilization are really sort of limit phenomenon for combustion and they're really transient phenomenon. You know, the flame's there and pop, the flame's gone. Uh, what I want to talk about in D and E is um, sort of d disturbances, sort of time harmonic disturbances or even uh, stochastic disturbances in reacting flows. And so in section D, what we're going to talk is just very generically about disturbances in reacting flows. And in particular, what I want to show you there is that there's three sort of canonical types of disturbances in reacting flows. Um, and those three are um, vortical disturbances, which is, if you've taken a turbulence class, really turbulence is the study of how vortical disturbances interact with each other. With the, um, there are acoustic disturbances, which are disturbances that propagate with the speed of sound. And there are entropy disturbances. And those three are, you, you, and I'll show you that you can have acoustic mode, vortical mode, and entropy mode. And a lot of problems in um, gas dynamics and combustion and aeroacoustics sort of are one subset of that. Um, but in particular, sort of the interaction of flames and acoustic waves is, is a really, um, again, it's a really rich topic. It's what leads to the whole issue of thermoacoustic instabilities which leads me to E, which is how do flames respond when you disturb them? Um, so you have probably talked about this before if you've taken a turbulent combustion class. Turbulent combustion is really how do flames respond when you disturb them with stochastic Navier-Stokes turbulence, right? Um, what's, what's the response? And in particular, how does the time average burning rate change? That's really the fundamental question in turbulent combustion is what's the sensitivity of the time average burning rate to um, <coughs> stochastic disturbances. Well, I want to generalize that a little bit, and we're going to talk more generally about how do flames respond to disturbances, either time harmonic disturbances or stochastic disturbances. And, um, and one of the things I'll show you is that when you excite a flame with time harmonic disturbances, some really interesting stuff happens that you never see when you think about just turbulent combustion. In the same way as you get interesting phenomenon when you think about light generated from a laser versus broadband light, right? You can get, when you start having uh, space-time coherent disturbances, you can get really interesting interference patterns, and you can get uh, um, reinforcing, uh, you can get, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, constructive, or you can get destructive interference patterns, and, uh, and, and this stuff happens. I mean, it happens in, in airplanes that are flying out there, and rockets, and so forth, and you got to understand this if you want to understand combustion instabilities. Um, so that's kind of a, a crash outline of the course. But like I said, sort of the overall philosophy of what I'm going to talk about here is, is if we think here, if we think about combustion devices uh, or combustor devices, actually I should have said combustor devices, um, and in particular things that, that influence the operational limits, is how do those flow back to sort of fundamental unsteady combustion processes, and then how do those flow back to sort of fundamental physical and chemical processes? So that's the outlook. That's the outline. Does anyone have any questions? OK, so let's get started. And we're going to go to A, Outlook, Introduction and Outlook. And so this is sort of a, these are what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what 
I want to back up a minute. Before I talk about combustion, I want to talk about the overall a larger cycle. And, and I'm going to do an example here. I'm going to talk about the Brayton cycle, which is a gas turbine. And then I want to think about the combustor. And then I want to think about some combustion problems that flow out of that. Um, I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about emissions and auto ignition. Emissions are pollutant emissions in particular. We're not going to talk about those. And you presumably are, have done some of that already. I'm sure many of you have already thought about NOx and carbon monoxide and soot emissions. But I want, for those of you who haven't, I want to, um, because many of the design decisions that influence, like why, why you know, why do you design a combustor that makes you th so thermoacoustically unstable or so susceptible to blow off? Might be a very fair question. And the reason is because I got to make this thing emit low NOx emissions. So it's worthwhile just talking about a little bit about emissions for a minute. Um, also, there's a really interesting operability issue, auto ignition, which we're not, I'm not going to have time to do a deep dive on, but I just wanted to do a quick high pass on it because it's an important in terms of setting operational limits of modern combustor devices. And I also wanted to just kind of sort of give you an, out, an, an idea of, of needed research and some interesting future problems that, that sort of flow out of, which I'm not going to have time to get into. All right. So let's get started. And um, this is not a, ga a gas turbine combustion class, but the gas turbine cycle is, a, is an interesting example to think about. So let's talk about a, the gas turbine cycle. Here it is. Um, and I'm going to assume that you've all seen that before, but basically you have air, it gets compressed, goes through a combustor, it's expanded through the turbine, and the turbine is either connected to a generator to generate electric power, or it expands through a nozzle to make thrust. And there's a couple important sort of macro cycle parameters for a simple cycle gas turbine. So in other words, a gas turbine where you don't use the exhaust to heat steam to run through a steam turbine, which would be a combined cycle. Uh, <coughs> so those two important parameters are one is the compressor pressure ratio, PR, which is the pressure coming out of the compressor relative to the compressor going into the compressor. That's a really important parameter for sort of steady flowing combustion systems. The second one is the turbine inlet temperature, T3, the temperature coming out of the combustor going into the turbine. Those are sort of, if you had to think about the two kind of macro parameters that affect sort of a lot of the baseline stuff, it's compressor pressure ratio, turbine inlet temperature. By the way, I know it's really hard to stay awake after, after lunch, and I can see many of you valiantly fighting the good fight out there to keep your eyes awake. So we'll take a break at, we're gonna take a break every hour. So we're gonna take a break at three, but uh, you won't offend me if you need to go outside and do jumping jacks. Um, but, okay, so let's, um, this is a, uh, a little cycle plot. So if you've taken thermodynamics, you'll have seen this before. But here's a simple cycle. It's what we just looked at. Um, and this would be a simple cycle used for generating electric power. This is a combined cycle where you take the combustor exhaust, which is still hot, and you use it to heat some steam, and, um, and you run that through a steam turbine. But this is a plot of the thermal efficiency, all right? as a function of specific output. So this is basically the power density of a simple cycle gas turbine. How much oomph do you get out of it per unit mass of, uh, or how big your power plant is? If you've taken a propulsion class, this would be the analog to specific thrust. For a specific thrust is how much thrust do you get per unit mass, air mass flow rate through the system. This is how much power do you get, it, do you get out of the power plant per unit at air mass flow rate. And as you can imagine, if um, the mass flow rate through the system kind of gives you a scale for how big it is. If you want to double the mass flow rate, you're going to have to double the area, the cross-sectional area, if you're going to keep all your velocities the same. Um, so this is like power density, and this is efficiency, right? So this is how efficient you are at, at converting um, energy into megawatts. And what's kind of interesting is a couple, couple couple quick comments here. If we follow a constant, um, well, let, let's just run through these. These horizontal lines are ISO pressure ratio lines. This is that compressor pressure ratio, 10, 12, 14, 16. And this right here, these are constant T3s, that turbine inlet temperature, right? So what this means is usually what happens is, is because of material limitations, you design a system for a given turbine inlet temperature, right? So you're going to be riding along one of these lines. And what it shows you is, let's just say I follow this line, that as I go up in compressor pressure ratio, the initially the, um, 
both the uh, specific power increase and the thermal efficiency increase. And then you reach this point here, this tangency point, where if you want to get a further increase in thermal efficiency, in fact, if you kept going, this curve would bend over backwards, that you, there's a trade-off that um, you uh, either you want, you're going to lose specific output if you want higher thermal efficiency. And so there's no reason you would ever design a cycle to be on this side of that curve because you could always do better. But usually you're going to be sitting on this side of the curve and it just shows you there's a trade-off between power density and efficiency. You know, if you want a real hot rod car, it's going to have lousy fuel consumption, right? It's going to, versus if you want something that's got really, really um, high miles per gallon, it's not going to be too sporty. It's sort of a classic. There's no free, free lunch. And the same thing happens in gas turbines, and that's what this, that's what this shows you. Um, but basically what it shows you as you go up, go up in pressure ratio, you get more thermal efficiency. Well, there's a combustion application to this. Many of you, I, I heard, I think, five people here talking about high pressure combustion, kinetics for high pressure combustion. Over here, somebody's doing supercritical laminar flame speed measurements, um, laser diagnostics in optically dense environments. Why do we care about high pressure combustion? Well, because if you want to get higher miles per gallon, if you want to get higher um, thermal efficiency, if you want to get higher um, sort of metrics around fuel burn, you need to go to higher pressure, right? So a modern aircraft engine is running at pressure ratios of around 55, 55 bars, right? Modern aircraft engine, the temperature going into the combustor, the cold air going into the combustor can be 1100 F, even future cycles 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really, really hot. That's the cold air. So the cooling air in a modern aircraft engine, if you think about it, if you ever go to California Pizza Kitchen or something where they have the pizza oven and there's the bricks and there's this pizza back there, that's the temperature of the cooling air for a simple cycle gas turbine. So you'd say, what kind of contorted person would call that cooling air? Um, and it's just, it just goes back to the fact that you, know, you want higher thermal efficiency, you're going to go up in pressure and you're going to go up in temperature. So this sets a very, very interesting combustion challenge is high pressure combustion. What are the kinetics? How do you make measurements in these optically dense environments? It's a pain in the neck. How do you put windows that you know, when you ignite your combustor, you don't blast the windows? How many of you running high pressure combustors have broke your windows? Nobody. You will. You will. You'll have a, you'll, you'll have a, you, you won't ignite and then you'll, you'll, you'll make a mistake and you hit the igniter again and bam, you just blew your windows and that means you got to take the whole pressure vessel back apart. That's what you're going to do all weekend. Um, so anyway, but that's this, that's what this curve is telling you. You want, you want higher thermal efficiency. So <clears throat> the other thing is, is now you can see now at a given pressure ratio that uh, as you increase turbine inlet temperature, um, specific output goes up. So what that means is if you want to get more power out of a cycle for a given size, like think about this as, um, you know, this is, this is specific thrust, it's, it's, it's power density. If you want more power density, you've got to turn up your turbine inlet temperature. Um, and so the, uh, and, 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 a, and again, these are numbers which are sort of given to combustion people. Basically, the people who design the turbine or people in the rocket world who design you know, the, the, the heat transfer, they'll tell you, this is how much temperature I can take. Don't give me any more. And, um, <coughs> but you, you're always going to be able to have a sportier cycle you know, if you can go to these, these higher temperatures. And if you think about power generation applications, um, one of the really interesting things happening nowadays is these temperatures are getting so high. They're getting up to, well, let me just ask a question. You probably have all learned a rule of thumb. When does NOx emissions really start to take off? 1800K, 1850K, you know, somewhere around there. So what's the rule of thumb? How do you make a combustor emit low NOx? You run it pre-mixed and you run it with a flame temperature less than 1850K, right? Um, but suppose I told you, hey, I'm a gas turbine manufacturer and our, and, our tur and our materials people have gotten out ahead of you and they're saying, bring it on. I can take a temperature of 2000K or 1950K. You'd say, well, hold on. That's going to make a lot of knocks. They say, well, you figure that out. You're the combustor person. I want you to give me a low, a low knock cycle. I, I want this combustor to stay within all the emission specs, but I need you to run at a temperature of 1950 or 2000K. That's an interesting combustion problem, right? And that's where the world is heading um, because the materials and turbine people 
are incredible. You know, they're, they can take something that's spinning super fast and can take 2,000 degree Kelvin, 30, what is that, 3100 F. That's really hot, 3100 F degree gas, and they can blast it at it. So that's a really exciting new combustion challenge for those of us who do combustion because there was a time where 1800 K was fine. And the, and the whole this job of a combustor designer was to say, you know what, I just gotta make, just do really good pre-mixing. So I don't have any hot spots, so my temperature always stays below 1800 or 1850 K. But now it's like, nope, I, need, I want that temperature to be 1950. Um, and actually, we'll talk about the reasons a little bit more next. So this is a simple cycle. If you come down here, this is a combined cycle. Um, and the world changes a little bit when you go to a combined cycle. Same plot, thermal efficiency, power output. Two things you'll notice. First of all, notice these thermal efficiencies are, you know, at least for this pressure ratio of 10 to 16, is in the 30%. And, and by the way, just to calibrate you, sort of a state-of-the-art power plant today, if it's a big, heavy frame gas turbine used for power generation, compressor ratio would be between 15 and 20. If it's an, what's called an aeroderivative, which would be a aircraft engine that's bolted to the ground with a generator, it might be 40 or 50 to one. If it's in modern aircraft engine, it might be 55 to one. Um, come down here, notice these thermal efficiencies are a good bit higher, and that's because what you're doing is you're capturing some of the, the enthalpy in the exhaust stream, that, that hot exhaust. And so it's more expensive because you gotta, you gotta have a, this big heat recovery steam generator and you have a steam turbine, but you make up for it and it, you can get more power with the same amount of fuel. So you have more capital cost, but less fuel cost. Um, but what you can see here is um, these, no, notice how the lines sort of flip. These, the constant turbine inlet temperature lines are sort of vertical. Here they're more horizontal, 2100, 2140. So these are constant turbine inlet temperature lines. These are constant pressure ratio lines. And now notice what's happened here is now as you go up in turbine inlet temperature, you're actually going to higher cycle efficiency for a combined cycle. And so if I, come, if I flash back to what I just said, this is what's driving turbine manufacturers to go to, to, to make the investments to design systems that can take these high turbine inlet temperatures. Because for a combined cycle, you lower your fuel burn. And you can reduce it by a lot. And so let's suppose that you're a power plant that's spending a million dollars a day on natural gas, which might be a, a real number for a big power plant. A uh, million dollars a day, that's a lot of money, right? If I can save you 1%, uh, if I can re reduce your fuel cost by 1%, what's, a mil what's 1% of a million? That's $10,000 a day, right? And there's 365 days in a year. So let's see, 365 times 10,000 is $3.6 million in fuel savings per power plant, right? So you can start seeing why that would be of interest. And how do you do that? You crank up the temperature going into the turbine. Okay, so simple cycle, you get a sportier cycle. Combined cycle, you get a, you get a um, lower fuel, better fuel economy cycle. And so that's what's driven a lot of this work. And so, like I said, sort of the state of the art is 65, the, uh, the, um, today the, the best power plants can achieve 63% combined cycle efficiency, which is awesome. The highest efficiency thermal devices on the planet today are combined cycle gas turbines powered by combustion, right? Combustion is, in, in, uh, and it's 63%. So 63% of the chemical energy in the fuel is turned into real electrical power put into the grid. It's awesome. Um, and the goal is to get to 65. We will be at 65 soon, and there are some plans to get to 70%. And how do you do that? You just keep pushing these numbers up. And so again, this, for those of you doing combustion, it means, Hey, that pressure vessel you made, that's really cool, but I want you to go to higher pressure and I want you to go to higher temperature. So lots of really interesting combustion physics problems there. But again, I think just going back to this Knox one, I think that one's a particularly fascinating one because I grew up, when I learned combustion, again, the rule was just keep your flame temperature below 1800K. I don't think people thought that we would ever get turbine inlet temperatures of 2000K. But how do you do low, how do you do low NOx combustion at 2000K? How do you shut down Zeldovich? is the question. All right, so uh, anyway, I hope that gives you a feeling for some sort of macro, how the, the big world out there is driving combustion research. Um, and I'm going really slow, I'm only on slide three. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the combustor now. Um, so how does the combustor fit within this larger energy system? So we've talked about sort of two boundary conditions which are given on the combustor, right? One's pressure, just, you, just go make it work. Give me, give me a, a cycle, you know, run it 50 bar, uh, run it, 
you know, a flame temperature of, of, of 3100F. Um, <clears throat> the, um, actually, let me just back up and give you, well, I'll, no, I'll talk about it here. Um, so th there's the boundary conditions, but, but you might ask, well, okay, but beyond that, how does the, how does the combustor fit within, within the larger energy system? And so you'd say, okay, so there's pressure ratio and there's turbine inlet temperature, but really the combustor has little effect on cycle efficiency or on specific power, right? Just it, what happens is that sets the fuel air ratio, that sets the pressure you have to run at. But you can have, you know, you can't, you know, a lot of people, times people ask me, hey, do you, is one of the research areas to increase the efficiency of combustion? And I say no, because combustion is 99.999% efficient and maybe even with a few more nines. Um, and so, you know, basically all the fuel's burned, so that's, that's not my job as a combustor designer, because when you're running at these high pressures and temperatures, unless you're about to blow off, you know, that's, that's one of the features of combustion. When, when you do high activation energy chemistry, one of the features of high activation energy is there's no such thing as sort of halfway. You're either all in or you're all out, right? Either you burn zero or you burn 100%. That's another way of saying what high activation chemistry means. Um, and combustion is high activation, chem high activation energy chemistry. Um, and uh, where was I going? I lost my thread. Um, nuts. It was really important, really thoughtful. Um, <laughs> so um, the combustor has little effect on cycle efficiency. And I'm only 45. I shouldn't be having senior moments, but I'm having one right now. Um, um, OK, well, anyway, we'll just keep going. Oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. So I was talking about how, okay, so, you know, the job of, of a combustor designer is not to make a more efficient combustor because it's already basically 100% unless the flame just blew out the back end, right? The other job of a combustor designer really is not to, well, the, okay, the, other, the, the one influence of the combustor on the overall cycle efficiency is the combustor pressure drop. So if you've taken a, a cycle class, you may remember you add these eta terms or these R terms. And so, okay, so you have a 4% combustor pressure drop. And so where does that combustor pressure drop come from? Well, part of it's you can't do anything about because whenever you add heat to a flow, you have a stagnation pressure loss. That's just life, right? Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. But there is a source of, of pressure loss due to flame stabilization, right? So when you stick a bluff body in a combustor flow, you do that on purpose because you need the flow to separate because you need a low velocity region. And that gives you a, a, a pressure loss. So, you know, you can affect, the combustor may have a 1% influence on overall cycle efficiency because of the fact that you got to stabilize the flame and because of the combustor pressure drop. So that's, that's, that's you know, that's, that's life. Um, but sort of from a, an order one point of view, the combustor doesn't really have an effect on cycle efficiency. But where the combustor matters is it has really important effects on other things. So <clears throat> um, I'll give you an example here. And, and the first one I'll say is the realizability of certain cycles. So example, I'm, I'm not from the southern part of the United States, but I've lived in the southern part of the United States, Atlanta. And um, I've picked up, or at least I've been observer of certain southern euphemisms. And one of them is, when mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Has anybody ever heard that one before? It probably translates into other languages. So if, if any of you have a mother, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, when mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So the translation of that to gas turbine combustor is when the combustor's pissed, nobody's happy, right? So in other words, when the combustor blows out, guess what? I flew here from Atlanta. And you can say the combustor has little effect on cycle parameters, but when the combustor blows out, that's bad, right? And if the combustor doesn't relight, I'm in big trouble, right? So that's a simple example, right? So in many cases, the combustor sets sort of operational boundaries, sort of where you can and can't go, sort of the most severe being, being blowout, right? Is that you can only do certain things, you can only accelerate or decelerate at certain speeds, uh, you have to be real careful as you go up in, el in altitude because pressures are dropping and kinetics slows down. Um, if you start looking at alternative fuels, you start really monkeying with blowout limits and things like that. So that's one simple example. Another example would be um, steam addition. So this is a common, steam or water addition, this is a common strategy 
or EGR means exhaust gas recirculation. So recirculating the exhaust back into the inlet. Um, and that's, that's a concept for reducing CO2, for, for, for generating cycles where you can capture the CO2. But you can only add so much steam to your, to your combustor before the combustor starts getting close to blowout and carbon monoxide emissions start to take off. And, there, and, and so steam addition has been used for, um, uh, in particular, in, in certain cycles as a way to get low NOx without lean premixing. Um, so that, that would be an example of that. So I talked about, uh, another would be engine operational limits, and I just talked about that. Uh, so blowout limits, oftentimes you'll have certain regions where you have really high thermoacoustic instabilities, and so you can't operate there. Um, in many cases, the combustor may set the transient response. So for example, a modern aircraft engine, the decel rate, the rate at which you can slow the engine down, is set by the combustor. Um, and the reason for that is, <coughs> if you, um, and obviously there's a control system in the background that's, that's moderating what the pilot does, but suppose the pilot said, you know what, I want half power, let me just pull back my fuel uh, by 50%. Well, there's sort of two time constants. One is the time constant of your fuel system. And the time constant of the fuel system is really fast. So if you tell those fuel injectors, cut the fuel by 50%, almost instantly they're going to drop fuel flow rate by 50%. There's also a time constant associated with your air flow rate, which is driven by the really heavy turbo machinery. Well, when, you, when the thing settles down into a new steady state, RPMs will drop, if, if, assuming it's not a, if it's an aircraft engine, air mass flow rate's going to drop. But if you just do a throttle chop, what you've just done is you've dropped your fuel air ratio by a factor of two. And you can move outside of your flammability range, your flame blows out. So what you have to do is you have to dial down the fuel air ratio slowly, such that the air, basically you have to make sure that you're matching the time constant of your air system because your fuel system is so fast. So that's a simple example of the how the transient response. And the same thing happens with going forward, right? You say, hit the gas. So you, wanna, you want three times the power. If you just blow three times as much fuel into the system, you could, you could easily have a rich blowout. Um, and then lastly, emissions from your plant. So I, think, I, don't, I don't think I need to explain this one, but you know, aircraft engines, uh, power plants, they have certain um, you, you can't operate if you're, if you're emitting too much NOx or if you're emitting too much carbon monoxide. You know, these, are, these are permits that are set. You know, some of the most stringent limits today are in, this, in the um, Southern California Air Quality District, right? SQ, so, yeah, you know, like LA, Los Angeles and so forth. Three parts per million of NO at 15%. So that's a low number, three ppm. Um, and so that has real implications on what your combustor looks like particularly if you want to be looking at a, these higher firing temperature cycles. Um, we, yeah, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, all right, does anyone have any questions? So, and then d this, th this uh, slide just kind of dives into this a little bit more important, a, a little bit more later, a, a little bit more detail. But, you know, so what are the important combustor pr parameters? Well, it needs to burn all the fuel. But as I've just told you, this is almost never an issue unless because, unless you're blowing out, which is where I put bl blowout here. The only place where combustion efficiency might be an issue is sometimes, let's just suppose you have an augment and, and a jet engine afterburner or something like that. And you know, if, when you see these pictures of a flame shooting out the back end of an aircraft engine, you know, you're not getting thrust from that. It looks really interesting, but that's reducing your combustion efficiency. Um, so so that's, that's really the only case that I'm aware of where you can drop, you need this thing to ignite. You need it to ignite on the ground. You need it to ignite when your plane is in Anchorage, Alaska. You don't want a different type of engine for Anchorage. Um, you need it to reignite if you blow out at altitude, right? I just talked about how when, if the flame blows out at altitude, let's just say you fly through a cloud full of water, um, you want to make sure that that flame does not blow out. But if it does blow out, it sure, is, it sure better reignite. And that's a very important part of qualification of a modern, um, modern uh, Jet engine is, is, is the reignition test. Have any of you seen these videos where they do the, um, the water test through the engine? They're pretty interesting. Uh, you can find them on YouTube, but they basically take you know, all the fire hoses in the neighborhood, blow them through the front end of the engine, massive cloud of steam blasting out the back, but the engine better not blow out. Um, uh, okay, operability, I talked about the, a few of these examples, but let me just, so what this is, operability means that just the, the, the engine's gotta operate right, right? It can't blow out, we talked about that. It better not oscillate, that's combustion instabilities. Um, the flame better not flash back. So for example, if this would be a kind of a cross section of a flowing combustion system, 
I'm premixing the fuel in the air. I got this, I got this premixed stuff. The flame better not come back here because if it does, this these this hardware is not designed for high combustion temperatures and you'll start melting components. It needs to have good transient response. Uh, so if I uh, let's see. I kind of got my slides out of, well, we're, we're going to talk all these in a little bit more detail later. But let me just first of all, just remind everyone, and you will all know the difference between a premixed and a non-premixed flame, but I just want to make a couple points here. That in a premixed flame, <coughs> well, let's talk about non-premixed flames first. Legacy combustion systems, older combustion systems use non-premixed technology, and the reason is very simple, is because they're simple and they're low cost. Um, you know, you have the fuel in the air introduced separately into the combustion chamber. And that makes it simple. It makes a system uh, with really high turndown. So if you want to reduce the power by a factor of 10, you just reduce the fuel flow rate by a factor of 10. The flame gets smaller by a factor of 10, no problem, right? Whereas if you have a premix system, if you want to reduce the fuel flow rate by a factor of 10, and you don't change your, and if your airflow rate doesn't change, um, you're going to be way outside the flammability limits. So you got to have multiple nozzles, and so you, you know, you can't just have a. You know, if you look at a, a, a gas turbine, for instance, a non-premixed gas turbine combustor has a single fuel nozzle. They're, you're dumping fuel from one spot. A, um, a lean premix system might have six fuel nozzles with lots of fuel circuits and extra valves and stages. The cost might be 10 times as much. Um, so that's why, but obviously the, the disadvantage of a non-premix system is, is that by doing this, you lose the ability to control what the fuel air ratio is at the flame. And because it's a non-premix flame, it runs at a V equals one, so high NOx unless you dump water into the combustion system. And the other thing is, is that because the fuel is separate from the air, as, it, as the fuel starts preheating close to the flame, it starts cracking and you make a lot of soot. So those are two significant challenges, which is why um, modern aircraft engines increasingly are going to premix design. So GE, General Electric, um, you know, they're, they've basically gone to a premix type design. Pratt Whitney has not. Um, but if you're looking at power generation type applications or industrial furnaces, everybody's gone premixed to do modern systems because you got to. That's just what you have to do to get low NOx. And the reason that for that is is because by premixing the fuel in the air, you as the designer can specify stoichiometry of burning. Right? You can say, I want the stoichiometry to be 0 0.505, and you can set your fuel and air flow rates, and that's what it'll be. Right? Um, so, but. Um, <clears throat> now, if we think about, let, let's just talk about that for a minute more then. What that means about how you actually design these systems. So this would be a cross section of a non-premix system. So if you think about, let's just, let's just think about a, a, an aircraft engine or a power plant. Your, your turbine inlet temperature is given to you. That's a boundary condition, right? Um, so this temperature coming out of the combustion chamber, this is sort of specified. And so you have a, you have a global fuel air ratio which is going to, and your global fuel air ratio is what's going to give you your turbine inlet temperature, but really important to differentiate the global fuel air ratio from the local one. Um, so what happens in a non-premix system is, is that only a small fraction of the air, maybe 30%, comes through the front end, and the fuel in the air mix, and you get this, this hot, very stable, really sooty primary zone, and then the rest of the air comes in downstream, and so if this is a plot of temperature versus downstream distance, here is the temperature dropping as a function of downstream distance till you reach the turbine inlet temperature. And this would be your flame temperature here. This would be your turbine inlet temperature. And um, well, what this means is, is that in a non-premix combustor looks is basically a piece of pipe with a whole bunch of holes in it. All right? So, and that is an acoustic muffler. So if you think of, if any of you ride a motorcycle, and you think about what does the, the muffler on your motorcycle look like. It's a straight piece of pipe with lots of holes punched into it. And it turns out, I won't get into it, that having those holes in a pipe are really, really effective acoustic dampers. What you're doing is the flame is always making sound. The flame is pumping energy into the acoustic field. What those holes do is they convert that energy into vortical energy. We'll talk about this on Wednesday, <clears throat> is that conversion between acoustic and vortical energy. So you damp out acoustic waves. So you might wonder, what's, so what's the big difference between the motorcycle muffler and an organ pipe? They're both basically pieces of pipe, right? But there's one very big difference. An organ pipe 
doesn't have lots of holes drilled in it, right? It is a solid piece of pipe and it resonates. It resonates, it has a very high Q resonance, a very high quality factor resonance. You generate a sound in it, it has a nice natural acoustic mode, very low acoustic damping. If you drilled lots of holes in an organ pipe, it would be a muffler that it wouldn't sound good. You would, it just wouldn't make sound. It wouldn't have that natural acoustic frequency. The sound, if, as you, you're blowing air through the reed in the bottom to make sound, it would just get dissipated very, very quickly. So non-premixed combustion systems are acoustic mufflers. All right? Now, premixed systems <coughs> look a little bit different. This is that same plot, temperature versus downstream distance. So this is the temperature profile in a non-premixed system. And, um, in a, in a premix system, what you do is you're trying to avoid that, that, that overshoot of temperature, right? That overshoot of temperature is what's making knocks. Um, and, the re and the way you do that is, is that you premix, but in order to get to your, you, so you, you don't want an elevated temperature, right? So what you want this profile to be as flat as you can. So if this is your turbine inlet temperature, you would like to design it such that your flame temperature is at your turbine inlet temperature, right? Well, what does that mean? The limit is, is you want every bit of air going through the front end of the combustion system. All right? Every bit of air. You don't want any air coming downstream. Um, and in reality, you need a little bit of air that, for cooling, for film cooling on the walls, which is why this curve drops a tiny bit. So what do you think? If I, if I, what, do you, what do you think that might look like acoustically? A premixed combustor. If all the air is going through the front, I'm not adding any air downstream. Like an organ pipe, yeah. So that's the difference. A premixed combustors are organ pipes, non-premixed combustors are mufflers. So this is why I think a number of you are working on thermoacoustic instabilities. Um, if you're working on thermoacoustic instabilities for energy applications, that's why. Is because flames are always making sound, they're pumping energy into the acoustic field, but you're doing it in a resonator in a premixed system, and so you get massive vibrations, huge oscillations, they destroy everything. They break stuff, they take metal and send it through the turbine. Never any good to throw metal through the turbine of a, combust of a, of a gas turbine. Um, but that's why. So again, I hope I'm helping you understand these fundamental problems, how they flow from sort of macro real world issues. Um, all right, I'm going too slow. So it's three o'clock. Why don't we uh, take a break, 15 minutes. We'll reconvene at 3.15. All right, thank you.